title of this morning's message is, It is the last hour, abide in Christ by the Spirit and through the Word. It is the last hour, abide in Christ by the Spirit and through the Word. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. So as we, uh, as we turn to a new year, 2023, we'll be returning to where I left off in, in 1 John. And we start the new year and return into 1 John with a very interesting warning and encouragement from John. Before we read the text for this morning, let me remind you of why John is writing this letter in the first place. What is his goal his mission for believers, what does he want for us, why is he writing this, and how is he accomplishing it? His goal for us, in this letter, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, 1 John 5, 13, that, why is he writing these things, that you may know, know, that you have eternal life. I write these things to you you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why? That you may know for sure, absolutely certain, that you may know in your mind, in your heart, that you may know that you have eternal life. We call this assurance. John is writing this letter so that those who truly believe, those who truly believe in the name of the Son of God, true believers, that we would know that eternal life is ours in Christ. Certainty. Certainty of what? Do you see it? Certainty of what? The certainty that we will live forever and ever with Jesus. Are you 100% certain of that? For sure, that you will live forever, not just live forever, but live forever with Jesus, eternal life. And who should have this certainty? Those who truly believe in the name of the Son of God. Those who truly believe in Jesus. Those who know God the Father and know Christ the Son. Do you truly know God? Not simply believe in your head. Not simply say you're something. Not even what we do. Do you know God? Do you know Jesus? We know that to believe in Jesus is not simply something we do in our heads. Because here it is in the NLT, James 2.19. You say you have faith. For you who believe that there is one God, good for you, even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. So there must be two types of belief. And this will help us get at why John is writing what he is writing in the text for today. There is the type of belief that leads to eternal life. Salvation. True belief. And those with true belief, those with saving faith, are those, John is writing to, so that we would have true assurance. That those who will be in heaven, those who will spend eternity with Jesus, know right now that that is true of us. That we would cast our doubts aside and believe Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. However, here's the danger. There is false belief. The kind of belief that would say, yes, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. And yet, not truly be saved. And that kind of belief leads to something else. Not true assurance, false assurance. Someone thinks they are saved, thinks they have eternal life, even calls himself a Christian, even sits under what is called Christian teaching, and yet is not saved, does not have eternal life. We remember from Matthew 7, many, many will come to Jesus at the end. Many will come to Jesus at the end, which we'll see in our text. The end is near. 
Many at the end will say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, did we not do works? Did we not do stuff in your name? And Jesus will say to them, away from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. So there is true belief, which is truly knowing Jesus, and false belief, simply believing something about God, or even in another Jesus, or another gospel, as Paul would say. There's true assurance, and there's false assurance. And so we should ask, how would someone come to think they are Christian, and yet not be saved? How does that happen? How would it be that someone would call themselves Christian, say they believe in God, and yet not have eternal life? How does that happen? False teaching. So how in this letter does John help those who truly believe, have true assurance, be absolutely certain that we will be with Jesus for all eternity, not in hell? Or maybe better asked, how does John help us know if our belief in Jesus is truly saving faith, saving belief? Or have we been tricked into thinking we have saving faith? Like many are and many will be, the Word of God makes that very clear. How do we make sure we don't have false assurance? And again I ask, how would one get a false assurance? How does someone end up thinking they truly believe when in fact they're deceived? Deceived into thinking they are Christian and yet they are not. Well, for the most part, this happens because of false teaching. From false teachers. False teaching from false teachers. And John is going to help us today see this and understand and even understand why some people can seem to follow Jesus for a while and then fall away. What in our day might be called deconstruction. What is that about? John will show us something about that today. And then John will end our text today as Christian read to start our time together this morning by giving us two ways, two ways in which those who have True assurance, those who are truly saved, how do we not fall away? How does God do that? With that open to our text. 1 John 2, 18 through 27. And he starts this way. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you, have, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This this is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you that about those who are trying to deceive you. Let me say that again. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. God's reforming and protecting word to us, his church, on this Lord's day. And there is a lot here. 
But we're going to break it down into some simple truths that I think we need to see. Truth number one. The end is near. And in the end, there are many false teachers. The end is near, and in the end, there are many false teachers. Verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. It is the last hour. And the more we see false teaching grow and abound, the more we should realize, according to this text, that the end is near. The day will come, for sure. You can be certain. The day will come when Jesus returns for his people. That day is coming. The day may soon come when Jesus will come to crush his enemies and win the war. And we are to live, we are to live as though that day is drawing near. Maybe even an hour away. The day where each of us will stand before him and be judged for all eternity. Children, y'all, It is the last hour. Are you ready? If Jesus came right now, or if he did come in an hour, or if you were to die today, are you ready to stand before a holy God? It is the last hour. That's how he starts. What does John mean when he says it's the last hour? And let me tell you, It is not only John who says this, Acts 2, 16 and 17. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams. Paul, 2 Timothy 3, 1. But understand this, that in the last days will come times of difficulty. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 2, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. James 5, 3, your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Jude, Jude 18, they say to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Peter, 1 Peter 1, 20, He, Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. 2 Peter 3.3, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. This is throughout the New Testament. We are in the last days. It is the last hour. The next major biblical event to happen in regards to Jesus is the return of Jesus. So what can we summarize from these texts about the last days? Well, first, we are in the last days. The last days started with the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, were confirmed by the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon all God's true people, the children of God, and in the last days, which will end with the return of Jesus, we live in the last days. Jesus has come and will come again. And we're to live as though that could be in the next hour. One of the things the writers of these texts, want us to know about the last days, one of the things we should have set in our hearts and in our mind about these last days is that we should know in the last days there will be many false teachers, many false believers, even scoffers. And many of these false teachers will claim to be Christian. They'll claim even to have special knowledge above what the Bible says or claim to be able to change or cancel what the Bible says. And church, we must know, 
It is the last hour. This world is passing away. Jesus could return in the blink of an eye. And in that time, in our day, confirmed by the word, false teachers abound. We will even see, they had even seen false messiahs. So we should ask, what is the evil goal of false teachers? Jesus, in Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and do what? Perform great signs and wonders. Why? So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Their evil goal, false teachers' evil goal, whether they know it or not, many are deceived themselves. Their evil goal is to lead astray those who call themselves followers of Jesus. And they'll do so by any means necessary, even signs and wonders they can do. They'll trick many into thinking they're Christian, when in fact they are not. That is their goal. They'll perform signs and wonders, which ironically... Many of them will claim the fact that they do signs and wonders it was, is what proves they are true teachers, and yet here Jesus says no. Signs and wonders do not prove they are true teachers. In some ways, signs and wonders might do the opposite. In the words of Jesus again, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray if possible even the elect. The words of our Lord Jesus, warning to us. They, those who are false, will use even signs and wonders and false teaching to lead many astray. And their false teachings are so powerful, so deceptive, that they would even trick God's chosen, His elect, the true people of God, if that were possible. And it is not. In our text today, we see John say, and we'll see it in our text today, John says, the Antichrist is coming. It is the last hour, it is the last hour, and the Antichrist is coming. And even 2,000 years ago, John said, many Antichrists had already come. Antichrist, the Greek antichristos. You might be surprised to learn that this word antichrist is used biblically, not in the way the modern church often uses it. This word antichrist is in this form only five times, only five times, all of them by John, four of them in this letter, two of them in this verse. Paul will make reference in 2 Thessalonians to this man of lawlessness that will come at the end. In Revelation, we hear of one on the earth who's like a dragon or a beast. But here we see Antichrist, the word Antichrist, used differently than we often hear it used. John says many Antichrists have come already in his day. Remember, this is not long after Jesus had ascended into heaven. John will later tell us, 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This, listen, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and listen to what he says, now is in the world already. So there is a spirit of the Antichrist, which was already in the world soon after Jesus ascended into heaven. Many many Antichrists had already come. There are many in our day who spend much of their time waiting for, trying to figure out who is the Antichrist, that the Antichrist will come. And yet here we see many Antichrists, many, had already come. Later, 2 John 7, for many deceivers, many deceivers already in John's day, not long after Jesus walked on the earth, Many deceivers had already gone out out into the world. 
those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So how can we summarize from the text? Remember, it is only John who uses this word, in this form at least. How can we summarize what an Antichrist is according to what we've seen? An Antichrist is anyone who denies truth about the Lord Jesus, especially teaching false things about the Lord Jesus. Whether it is teaching Jesus is not the Messiah, or Jesus did not come in the flesh, or Jesus is not the Son of God, who is coming again. An Antichrist is anyone that deceptively gets people to turn their eyes from the one true Jesus and the truth about Jesus. An Antichrist, that word just means against Christ, is so deceptive, this is so deceptive, that it will cause some people to follow a false Jesus and think he is the true Jesus. These teachings are so deceptive, they get masses of people to think they're following some Jesus, which is a false Jesus, and think they is a true Jesus, even, according to Jesus, using signs and wonders, if need be. Many antichrists had already come in John's day, according to the words of John. So I ask you, what would that say of our day? Because like John... I can say to you, children, it is the last hour. And so, as you have heard, the, that Antichrist is coming. So now, many, many, many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. What is the main goal of the devil in this spirit of the Antichrist? To cause deception and confusion in the church. To deceive many to follow the wrong Christ, the wrong Jesus. To believe the wrong truth. All the way to hell. And in the last hour, which we are in, many will be deceived. Truth number two. Those who truly fall away were never truly saved, and their falling away is for our good. Those who fall away were never truly saved, and their falling away is for our good. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So some had been among them. And they turn away, likely causing confusion among the people John's writing to. He's writing to encourage them not to be confused or deceived. Why did these who seemed they were of us now fall away, turn away to some other teaching about Jesus? Notice, that's what they, tur they turn to. Not away from Jesus, to some other Jesus, to some false teaching about Jesus. And so there's confusion. Some of these in this congregation may be even tempted to follow these other false teachings as well. And so what does John say? What should they think about it? What should we think about it? John is pointing us and them to a deep theological truth, a truth that is to help us, encourage us, strengthen us, keep us from confusion when we see others fall away, even those who were once of us. Much like when Paul says of the Jews that not all who were descended from Israel truly belonged to Israel, here John is telling us not all who went to church, even some who seem to be strong members of the church, even teachers or leaders in churches, John is warning us that not all of them are truly of the church. These are folks who outwardly look or looked to be part of the church, even claim to believe, even seem to have signs of saving faith, maybe even can perform signs and wonders, even have first fruits of the Spirit, but eventually they start to deny some truth. Deny some, some truths of the Word, eventually walk away from the one true faith to some other gospel, to some other Jesus, which is no gospel and no Jesus at all. 
And what are we to think of that? How are we not to be confused by that? Did they have salvation? Did they truly have salvation and lose it? Answer, no. Unless, of course, at one time they come back to the one true faith. What if their way looks fun or exciting with many signs and wonders? What if their way is easier? Should we join them? No. There is a false theology that would look at this church John is writing to, that would look at this church John is writing to, and say something like, look at all the people falling away. What's wrong with them? And look, it shows that people can truly have faith and truly lose saving faith. And John's response is, no, that's not what happened. John is telling us a beautiful, encouraging, powerful truth that should give us who truly are saved much assurance. Those who are once seeming to be of them, or of us, that walk away from the truth of them, John says, they were not of us. They were not of us. Because those with true saving faith continue in the faith and persist in the faith till the end. Those with true saving faith persist in the faith till the end. So he says, if they were of us, they would have continued with us. And this is good for us to know. Why is this good for us to know? Honestly, in many ways, in many times, those who have weak faith, wavering faith, up and down faith, it's this truth that they don't believe or believe something false about. Why is it good for us to know this? First, so that it is obvious what true faith is, that we would not be confused by those with false faith or those who deconstruct or those who fall away or those who start to deny some truths of the word or deny the gospel or come up with some other Jesus or come up with some sin-affirming lie. A lie of the devil. This is God protecting his true people from confusion and from falling away. God protects his children And one of the ways he does this is by having false followers fall away. Especially false teachers. Oh, how many false teachers are being exposed and falling away or falling into sin in our day. In some ways, it may shake us when this happens or cause us to be confused. Maybe even in the words of Jesus, by their signs and wonders, we may be confused. Or confused how they once seemed could have once have seemed to be of us and now seem to not. And yet here we see their falling away is for our good. Why? That we might know who is true and not be deceived by the false. Much like Judas followed along for many years and for some time and no one, no one but Jesus, even the disciples did not know he was false. False. Until the end, when he fell away and proved he was never truly of them. Because those God truly saves, God always keeps. Those God truly saves, God always keeps. He will never lose a single one of his sheep. Ever. So those who fall away or deconstruct were never truly saved. How does God keep his true sheep, his his true sheep, his chosen, his elect? Well, one of the ways God protects us is by having false teachers and false followers eventually fall away from the faith, proving, revealing their false theology, their false gospel, their false teachings. And often they fall into sin or fall into ways affirming sin, proving they were never of us. Truth number three. We who are truly saved are anointed in the Holy Spirit of God and kept by the Word of God. We who are truly saved are anointed in the Holy Spirit of God and kept by the Word of God. 20 and 21, but you have been anointed. So he's turning the, he's turning the page here. He's, he's turning and looking now at these believers, saying, don't be confused. Antichrists have come. False teachers will be everywhere. Many will fall away. They were never of us, but for you, don't be shaken by that. And here's another way why he says this should not shake us. 
but you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you have all knowledge. And I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. John turns his attention to true believers to strengthen our faith and our assurance, reminding us of two ways in which God keeps those who he saves. First, we are anointed in the Holy Spirit of God. What does this mean? This word anointed may be used in the, in the New Testament differently than often used. This word anointed... It's actually not all that often used in the New Testament. In this form, in the form we see it here, it's only used by John. John's the only one. Three times in our text today, and that's it. In its other form, the word anointed used in the New Testament is used to refer to true believers being anointed by the Holy Spirit and sealed by the Spirit for salvation. The only other way anointed is used in the New Testament is in the discussion of Jesus, Jesus being anointed with the Spirit for his ministry. So John makes it clear that all true believers are anointed. Anointed how? By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God unto salvation. Did you know that? If you are a true believer, then you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. And John tells us this anointing, it does something to us. Those who are filled with the Spirit, those who are truly saved, what does it do for us here? Well, how does it help us when there are false teachers everywhere, even doing signs and wonders? How do we not get confused when many fall away or are following some other form of Christianity or some other Jesus, believing some other gospel? How does the Holy Spirit anointing us help us with that? Those who are filled with the Spirit will know the truth when we hear the truth. The Holy Spirit does that. Those who are filled with the Spirit, anointed with the Spirit, when they hear the truth, we will know the truth. The New Testament says that if you're a true believer, you have this anointing, and that anointing comes from God, and that anointing is the Holy Spirit, and those who have the Holy Spirit will hear truth with their ears, the knowledge of God, and when we hear it, we will know it is true. John here is actually doing some mocking. He's mocking anyone, any false teacher who claimed to have some special knowledge. Some knowledge outside of the Word of God or have, have gotten something from the Holy Spirit outside of the Word of God that, that doesn't align with the Word of God or maybe have some special anointing that gives them a secret truth. John's saying, no, it's not even a thing. This anointing is the Holy Spirit given to all true believers, and that anointing will allow true believers to know what is true from the word of God and what is false teaching being proclaimed by false teachers. Because what separates the true believer from a false believer? The truth we believe. The true will hear the truth and know if it's the truth being taught by a true teacher. Those who are truly saved will hear the truth and know it is the truth being taught by a true teacher. The false would rather, obviously they would never say this, obviously they would never say this, but the false would rather, and maybe they don't even know this, but they would rather hear false teaching from a false teacher who twists the truth. And at that point, most of them are deceived and don't even know that's what's happening. And what is the main difference between the two? The Holy Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit does. This anointing allows us to hear what is true, know what is true, and hear the false and know what is false. Those who do not have this anointing will claim to be spiritual, but it is not the right spirit, not the Holy Spirit, and therefore does not, cannot truly hear the word of God, even would rather hear false teaching or 
or have no ability to discern what is true from what is deception. Truth number four. True faith starts and continues believing foundational truths about Jesus. Verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. <clears throat> Denial of the Bible's foundational teachings about Jesus is a certain mark of false faith and false teaching. Here John mentions one. He mentions the false confession that would deny Jesus as the Son of God. Anyone who would deny Jesus as the Son of God. In verse 22, if you look in your Bibles, in verse 22 he mentions this false confession that would say Jesus isn't the Messiah. In, for, in Paul, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 tells us many false believers cannot accept Jesus as Lord. Later in this very book, John will say, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Remember, John is writing this not long after Jesus ascended into heaven. And he says, test the spirits, do not believe every spirit. Many false prophets had already gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Another confession. Jesus in the flesh from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming. And listen what he says. And now, this Antichrist, and now is in the world already. So falsely spiritual in general, will deny some foundational truth about Jesus is. Either deny Jesus as the Son of God, or deny Jesus as the Messiah, or deny Jesus as Lord, or deny Jesus had come as a man in the flesh, or deny Jesus is coming again. And all of these are gospel issues. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. Jesus is and was and always will be. Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus came to die for and save his people from their sins. He rose again from the dead to prove once and for all that he is Lord of lords, worthy to be followed as such, and to deny any of these truths about Jesus, either with your words or your life, is to not deny the one true Jesus. And instead, follow some other Jesus. And likely, those who do that will walk away altogether. So John is teaching us that those who are false will eventually teach or believe something false about Jesus and who Jesus really is. Notice, false teachers, false believers even, they teach something about Jesus, some, something that they would call gospel. But in the words of Paul, there is no other gospel. No other Jesus. So to distort the teachings about who Jesus is and how he saves is a clear mark of a false teacher or a false believer and is the spirit of the Antichrist. And yet one thing for us to know, often that is not where false teaching starts. Often it is a slow fade into this false belief or false teaching. And usually it is to affirm some sort of sin or some other way of living. And it eventually ends with a denial or twisting of the truth about the one true Jesus and his one true gospel. Truth number five, therefore, we should abide in the hearing of the truth to abide in God. Abide in the hearing of the truth to abide in God. Verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Now notice, he's making an assumption here. He knows what they heard in the beginning was true. He's not saying if you believe something false in the beginning, abide in that. He's making an assumption. He knows something about them. This is a key truth that ties all of this together. It shows us that a work of the Holy Spirit, a main work of the Holy Spirit, is to empower true believers to hear the true word preached and understand what is truly aligned with the truth handed down by the apostles. 
A work of the Holy Spirit, a main work of the Holy Spirit, is to empower true believers to hear the true word of God preached and understand what is the truth as handed down by the apostles. For us, that would be the word of God, the Bible. Twice, though, he says, what you heard. This is one of the reasons why we hear the word preached on Sundays, why we hear the word taught on Wednesdays. Because the true teaching and hearing of the word is a means of growth in the Christian walk. Let me say that again. The true teaching of the word and hearing of the word is a means of growth in the Christian walk and one of the ways God keeps his people. The teaching and preaching of the word is a means of growth for every Christian in a way that God keeps all of his people. John is not saying, just remember one truth you heard a while back and you'll be fine. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. Don't fall for this false teaching. Once you hear true teaching, be actively presently, that's the verb tense here, be actively presently abiding in true teaching. Stay in it. Do not leave the truth once you hear the truth. He's been warning us already of the dangers of false teaching, and now he says, actively abide in the truth. Once you hear the truth, and if you do, there's a promise. God will keep you in the truth, and you will be saved in him. The Holy Spirit does not enable us to know truth about God beyond what is in the word of God. The Holy Spirit does not enable us to know truth about God beyond what is in the Word of God, only truth about God that aligns with the Word of God, and it is the preaching of the Word that is the power of those who are true believers, the hearing of the Word. It is the Word of God preached to the people of God that is a means of God to keep the people of God abiding in the Son of God and the Father God. Preaching of the Word of God. When you come here and hear the word preached, is that what you know is happening? Is that what you think is happening? That God is growing you and keeping you through the preaching of the word. This is why the true preaching of the word is so important. Are you excited and, and anticipatory when you come here to hear the word preached, to know God is going to do something in you? Whether you know it or not, that's what God is doing when you hear, when you actively hear the word of God preached. This is not a TED Talk on the Bible. At least it shouldn't be. When the word of God is truly exposited from the word of God as the word of God, it is the word of God. It's God speaking to the ears of his true people by his spirit, and when you have repented of your sin and are living by faith in Jesus, if that is you this morning, right now, through his word, if you are actively hearing the word of God, God is doing a work in you to grow you and to keep you. If you are not growing in your faith, if you're slipping, if your faith is weak, you should ask, am I actively hearing the word of God when it is taught? I can say as a preacher, People I have seen grow the most dramatically and are most confident in their faith are those who actively, even aggressively, eat up the word of God when it is taught or preached. This is a promise. And I can tell you, it is true. However, any preacher who teaches what is not in the word of God or twists the word of God to fit with what they want to say, or worse, teaches things that they would say are from the Holy Spirit and yet do not align with the Word of God. Any preacher that would do that is not a Christian preacher. They are not of God, even of the Antichrist. 2 John 9, anyone who goes on and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. That word teaching in that text is the same word as the word for doctrine. There are no new doctrines that are not in the word of God. There are no new teachings or new Christian teachings that do not align with the word of God. There are megachurches, famous pastors, even entire local 
congregations, denominations that claim to have new doctrines or for one reason or another do not need to align their teachings with the word of God. Their doctrines are not aligned with those handed down by the apostles in the word of God. We know that is false teaching. But what does that do to those who are hearing that teaching? It puts them in danger of not truly abiding in the one true Son of God. It separates the hearers from the Father God. The Holy Spirit always agrees with the Word of God. Or it is not the Holy Spirit, it is some other spirit, even an Antichrist. So remember and believe that when we abide in the Word of God, when we abide in the Word of God, when we spend time together studying the Word of God, when you come and sit under the proper preaching and teaching of the Word of God, God is doing a miracle in you and for you. Simply stated, when you abide in the teaching of the Word, you abide in the God of the Word. When you abide in the teaching of the Word, you abide in the God of the Word. And we can't do that on our own power. We need God to do it in us by his spirit. Truth number six, trust that the Holy Spirit in you will reveal truth to you and protect you from false teaching. Trust that the Holy Spirit in you will reveal truth to you and protect you from false teaching. 26 and 27, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Remember, that's his entire motive here. Deception is everywhere. False Christian teaching everywhere, already in John's day. What's he doing? Protecting us from those who would try to deceive us. But the anointing, Holy Spirit here again, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you. You have no need that anyone should teach you, but his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is as taught you. Abide in him. We need to notice the context here. Even back in John's day, right after Jesus ascended into heaven, there were already false teachers claiming to be Christian teachers who were deceptive. They were everywhere, yet they were of the devil. And what John is saying here is that the anointing with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit and sealed by the Spirit, works in God's true people by helping us hear false teaching as deceptive false teaching. It's protective. John had heard Jesus say something similar to him in John 14. Jesus said, These things I have spoken while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all, all that I have said to you. And here's John saying the same thing in our text. When you hear true teaching, the Holy Spirit will work in those who have the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth. The Spirit will work in those who have the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth and to protect you from deception. Of course, of course, we are to do this for each other. Elders, leaders of the church are even called to do this for the flock. But this is a work, ultimately, of the Holy Spirit. Some have and would twist these verses to say... Here's the good news. You don't need teachers anymore. You can know the word of God on your own without teachers, and whatever God tells you, that's true for you. You might think that's crazy, but it's rampant. That's not what this is saying at all. Jesus in the Great Commission, he tells us to teach, teach each other to observe everything he's commanded, Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, and God has appointed in the church apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Ephesians 4, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. 1 Timothy 4, 11, command and teach these things. 2 Timothy 2, 2, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who can teach these things also. 2 Timothy 2, 24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone and able to teach. So then what's John saying here? Why the command to teach and preach the word? And yet he says this here. What does he specifically mean when he says, if you've been anointed but with the Holy Spirit, you don't need anyone to teach you. Teach you what specifically? Well, what is he talking about? 
teach you to hear what is false as false. He's saying there is a work of the Holy Spirit that when you hear a teaching, it is the Holy Spirit you need and you need to trust that will protect you, protect those who have the Holy Spirit and allowing us to hear teaching and know if it aligns with the true word of God. We still need to be good Bereans. Acts 17, 11. They examine the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. And yet, we hear the word preach, we go examine the scriptures to see if it's true, and it is the Holy Spirit in us that ultimately does that work. Let me say it like this. True believers who have the Holy Spirit will hear false teaching and have a spiritual sense that it does not align with the word of God. Remember, we need each other, you need the word. You need to see if it aligns with the word. But remember, John started this by telling them many antichrists will come. That's his, that's his meaning. That's his context. Many antichrists have already come. They will say they are of Christ, yet they will teach things that do not align with the teachings of the Christ. Things that do not align with the word of God. And so God will give you a teacher, a helper, anoint you with the Holy Spirit in his true people to help us discern these false believers, that they are in fact false. So these last two truths go together, and here's how. This is what the Word of God is telling us. Here is how we resist false teaching. First, you go to the truth. First, you go to the truth. You sit under the preaching of the truth. You go to the teachings of the apostles. You know and study and sit under the preaching and teachings of the Word. The teachings of Christ, the Word of God. And when you do... It's not your own intellect. It's not your own power. It is the Holy Spirit who will work these things in you and protect you from false teaching. So when you hear false teaching, what do you do? You flee from it. You run from it. And where do you run? To the truth. Abide in it. Trust in the truth. Obey the truth. Live the truth. Run from any false teaching that would teach you anything other than salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Any teaching that changes who Jesus is or what he has done. Any teaching that tells you you can follow this Lord Jesus as Lord and yet live in sin. Flee from it. And when the Holy Spirit teaches you that something's true in your heart, don't ignore that. Don't go with itching ears to find someone to teach you what you want to hear. Abide in the truth. The Spirit will lead you to the truth. When you hear something that the Holy Spirit tells you is false, check the Word. Check the teachings of the apostles. Study the Word with one another. Let the Spirit do His work by helping us. Another way to summarize these last two truths is this. If anyone says, I have the Spirit, and that Spirit leads them away from Jesus, or away from the teachings of the Word, or to disobey the Word, that is not the Holy Spirit. It is some other spirit, or a spirit of deception, or of an Antichrist. Because the Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus. To know Jesus, trust Jesus, love Jesus, and obey Jesus. Since this is important, let me say it one more way. Let the word abide in you as you abide in the Spirit who will lead you to the Son of God as you are kept by the Father of God, by the Father God through the Word of God. Let the word abide in you as you abide in the Spirit who will lead you to the Son of God as you are kept by the Father of God, by the Father God through the Word of God. Truth number seven. This is it. Trust in these truths, remembering the ultimate promise from God in Christ is eternal life. Verse 25. And this is the promise that he made to us. Eternal life. How good is that short verse? How good is this short word of God to us? This is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. This is a promise 
But in the context of this text, it's also a warning to any who would not abide in the Spirit, who would follow false teaching, who would not abide in the Word of God, because this is what's on the line. That's what he's saying. This is what's on the line. This is how important this is. This is why John is writing this letter to us. This is why false teaching is such a big deal. Eternity is at stake. So trust the Word of God. Abide in the Spirit of God. Because God is keeping His true people. And what is He keeping us for? What is the promise? Eternal life. God is holy. Without Him, we are pitiful sinners. Without Him, we will be deceived by false versions of Christianity. Many false versions have been around even since the time of John. And those that follow false teachers are in danger of never having eternal life, even thinking they do the whole time. And yet God sent His Son Jesus, born a baby, lived the perfect life that we could not live. He came to save us. That perfect Jesus, all man, yet the Son of God, the Messiah, died on a cross to take the punishment and wrath for the sins of many. Jesus did not stay dead. He rose again to life, ascended into heaven, and through His death and resurrection, in the new covenant, has been inaugurated. And part of that new covenant is this. If you've turned from sin, if you live by faith in Jesus, if that is you, then God has anointed you with His Holy Spirit because He loves you, and a good and powerful God will keep all of His true children. And it is by His Spirit and through His Word that He does that. 1 John 2.25, and this is the promise that He made to us. Eternal life. Amen? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, what a glorious promise. Whether we see it or not, we live in a spiritually dangerous time, a dangerous world. And yet you love us. You have given us your word. You have sealed us who are yours with your spirit. May we trust you. May we never flee from you. May we sit under the teaching of your word and know that there is power. Help us, Lord. We cannot, we cannot keep ourselves from deception without your help, so help us. Reveal to us, our ears and our eyes, what is true. And even help us, as it says in Jude, help us snare those, snatch them from the fire, keep them from falling for these false teachings. Use us, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing.